What happened to Paul Revere and the Raiders? Paul Revere Dick was born in Harvard, Nebraska on January 7, 1938. River was his high school nickname given to him by his leather-clad biker friends. By 1959, they were known as the Downbeats, a name derived from a jazz magazine. Revere and his band went to a little recording studio in the neighborhood in late 1960 and cut a half dozen recordings before selling them. In early 1961, he arrived at John Gus's Gardena Records pressing plant, where he was not only consented to cut a record from Revere's tape, but also proposed changing the band's name to Paul Revere and the Knight Riders. Revere rejected the moniker and eventually settled on Paul Revere and the Raiders, the name that appeared on the group's first song, Beatnik Sticks, a boogie-woogie version of Chopsticks. Local radio stations largely rejected the song, as did a follow-up named Paul Revere's Ride, but their third effort, an instrumental called Like Long Hair, became a hit. The track debuted at number 38 on the Billboard Hot 100 in March 1961, earning the trio their first visit on Dick Clark's American Bandstand. Things seemed to be looking bright for the Raiders, but Revere was drafted before they could release another album. The band continued as Paul Revere's Raiders for a while with a teenage Leon Russell on piano, but without Revere's leadership, the band disbanded, and Mark Lindsay went to California to pursue a solo career. Revere was eventually able to complete his military service as a cook at a mental institution in Wilsonville, Oregon. Revere and Lindsay reformed the band in 1962, and after a series of guitarists came and went, long-serving drummer Mike Smith finally joined. Returning to the local dancing, the band immediately gained a reputation for their wild stage antics and became one of the most popular bands in the Northwest. The band continued to record, but it wasn't until they went to Northwest Recorders in Portland and recorded Louie Louie, they achieved any notoriety. The Raiders recorded their version of the song a week before the Kingsmen did theirs in the same studio, which is an interesting fact. The Raiders single was released on April 25, 1963, and despite having a larger, harder driving sound, the record buying public would prefer the Kingsmen version, propelling it to number two by November of that year. The Raiders single, on the other hand, caught the attention of Ken Bolster, a local Columbia Records rep. Paul, Mark, and Smitty were passing by a costume shop at the time and noticed some Revolutionary War uniforms in the window. They rented the coats and wore them for the second half of that night's play to add to their already outrageous stage act. They were such a hit that Paul had some outfits manufactured for the band after renting them a couple more times. Near the end of the summer of 1963, guitarist Drake Levin and bassist Mike Doc Holliday joined the Raiders and the band recorded Louie Go Home, a follow-up to Louie Louie, which only had regional popularity as did their third Columbia single, Over You, which only had regional success. Terry Melcher, a staff producer at Columbia Records, was now in charge of the Raiders recordings. Melcher and his collaborator Bruce Johnston became recording stars in their own right, releasing surf songs under the names The Ripcords and Bruce and Terry. Mike Holiday was replaced on bass guitar in early 1965 by Phil Volk, who had previously performed in a band named The Surfers with Drake Levin. His boyish good features and the nickname he gave himself for his toothy smile, Fang, quickly made him a fan favorite. Dick Clark was seeking for a crew to work with on his upcoming pilot for a TV show called Where the Action Is, and word got out. The Raiders, together with Linda Scott, Steve Valimo, and Tommy Rowe, were hired after being recommended by Clark's secretary, who had seen them perform in California. On June 27, 1965, ABC TV broadcasted the first episode of the show. The Raiders performed at a CBS Records convention in Miami in July, which led to the company's permission for a summer tour across the country. The Raiders were able to renegotiate their contract, becoming the show's stars after a combination of TV exposure and live gigs propelled their debut album onto the national charts after 13 weeks, with the single Stepping Out reaching number 46. Just like me, their next album was released in November 1965. It was the group's first top 20 success, reaching number 11 on the Billboard chart thanks to a scorching multi-track guitar solo by 11. The anti-drug song Kicks, written by Barry Mann and Cynthia Vai, reached number 4 on the Hot 100, followed by another Mann Vai piece, Hungry, which reached number 6 in 1966. Despite the Raiders' success with only band members on their tracks, producer Terry Melcher began adding session musicians to the Raiders' recordings, 
beginning with the strange tune The Great Airplane Strike, which reached number 20. In the 1960s, a band's identity or image in the eyes of its followers was formed and maintained not just by its music, but also by the sense of friendship, devotion, and personality that is portrayed. Few bands could brag that their fans knew all their members by first name or nickname. The Beatles, The Stones, The Monkees, and Paul Revere and the Raiders were among others who made the list. In the spring of 1966, Raider fans were alarmed to find that guitarist Drake Levin had left the band to join the National Guard before getting conscripted. Following Drake's departure, Revere recruited Jim Valley from Dawn the Good Times, a Northwest band. Harpa was his nickname due to his striking likeness to one of the Marx Brothers. Just as Good Thing climbed to number 4 near the end of 1966, Jim joined the boys on action in the studio and on a hectic tour schedule. If anything, his charisma was even broader than Drake's and it swept over any reservations true admirers had over Levin's departure. In the spring of 1967, the Raiders continued to have success, with ups and downs reaching number 22. Jim Valley became frustrated and quit at this time since he couldn't get the band to record any of the songs he'd composed. Drake Levin, who had returned, took his place. Levin, Volk, and Smith split up soon after to form Brotherhood. The group told Revere and Lindsay that they wanted to shift away from the teeny bopper market and become more relevant to current events. Paul Revere and the Raiders' final fancy as a genuine rock and roll band quickly dissipated. Lindsay, Revere, and producer Terry Melcher were left behind, but they're revealed as Oz-like men behind the curtain of a hit-making machine that was soon to be snuffed out by a rising flood of truly authentic rockers, such as Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, The Doors, and the Beatles' resurgent talent. When the group's power trio left, the group's relevance faded. Freddie Weller, Charlie Coe, and Joe Carrero Jr. were brought in to replace Drake, Bang, and Smitty respectively. For the next seven years, Keith Allison would take over as bassist from Coe. Technically, these players were probably better musicians than the guys they replaced, but after scoring a number five hit with Him or Me, What's It Gonna Be, they only had a string of less than classic hits. And here's the hits, or minor hits, from 1967. I Had a Dream reached number 17, Peace of Mind number 42, after which Melcher left the band, Too Much to Talk number 19, now in 1968, Don't Take It So Hard number 27, Cinderella Sunshine number 58, and now 1969, Mr. Sun, Mr. Moon at number 18, let Me, number 20, and We Gotta All Get Together, which reached number 50. And it was their last charting song in the 1960s. The group's final song was Indian Reservation. The song was the first and only Raider single to hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Mark Lindsay's solo singles Miss America and And the Grass Won't Pay No Mind continued to chart. Rick Nelson's Stone Canyon Band toured with Phil Fang Volk. Phil played the lead in A Blast from the Past, a Broadway musical-styled production. His wife, Tina Mason, and their children, Kelly and Jessica, joined him on the road. Drake Levin later collaborated with Lee Michaels, Emmett Rhodes, and the Curtis Lawson Band. Drake died of cancer in 2009 at the age of 62. Jim Harpo Valley, the Raiders' replacement, relocated to Washington and began recording children's music programs, as well as releasing a few solo albums. Later, he worked for the Tacoma School District, where he taught music to outstanding pupils. Freddie Weller moved to Nashville and established himself as a successful country music songwriter. Joe Carrero began his career as a jazz drummer in Los Angeles. Keith Allison also went to Los Angeles and did some TV work, including portraying Captain James J. White in Gods and Journals in 2003, and guest appearances on Blossom, Seventh Heaven, and The Love Boat. When Mark Lindsay's solo career faded, he went to work for United Artists Records as the head of A&R and also wrote and recorded advertisements. He also constructed his own studio, where he recorded everyone from Ringo Starr to Harry Nilsson, and stayed mostly out of the spotlight in the music industry. He was convinced to sing a few songs when he was invited to headline a series of live shows for Chrysler in 1985. He signed on to the 100 Cities Superfest tour, which he carried into the new millennium after realizing how much he missed playing. Mark Lindsay played in front of a sold-out crowd of over 10,000 live fans in Portland, Oregon in September 1997. 
Mark joined the Heavy Together Tour for the 2010-2011 touring seasons. He was also hosting events on the Holland America cruise ship in the spring of 2012. The Oregon Music Hall of Fame inducted Paul Revere and the Raiders in 2007. They continued to travel extensively in 2012, 2013, and 2014. Mark Lindsay toured with the Turtles Flo and Eddie, the Grassroots, the Buckinghams, and Mickey Dolans in 2013. The passing of Paul Revere on October 4th, 2014 at the age of 76 stunned and devastated fans. For a year, he had been battling cancer. Revere and his Raiders were slated for gigs well into 2015 despite physicians' request that he take a break. After Paul's death, his son Jamie formed Paul Revere's Raiders, a band that performed around the United States in 2015, 16, and 17. Mark Lindsay participated in the 2016 Flower Power Cruise and released a new album called Summer of Love in 2016. The 74-year-old singer continued to perform live in 2017 at a few chosen places in the United States. Keith Allison, a member of the Raiders from 1968 to 1975, died on November 17, 2021 at the age of 79 of natural causes. He had previously recorded and performed with Roy Orbison, The Beach Boys, The Righteous Brothers, Chuck Berry, Alice Cooper, Rick Nelson, The Crickets, and Johnny Rivers before joining the band and playing the guitar and harmonica on Sonny and Cher's mega hit, The Beat Goes On. And as of 2022, Mark Lindsay is still alive and well. And that's what happened to Paul Revere and the Raiders. Thank you for watching, like and subscribe if you haven't already. And this has been one of my most requested videos of all time, so it's finally up. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you guys again for watching. My favorite Paul Revere and the Raiders songs are on screen. Give me some of your favorite as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.